In 2005, a gang of 34 members stormed the Brazilian Central Bank Vault. They stole $80 million. This operation was considered the largest bank robbery in Brazil's history. The strange thing is that the Central Bank Vault is equipped with surveillance cameras, thermal sensors, and high security systems. How did they go in, steal the money, and get out without the alarm working? Police investigations continued for years. Most of the thieves wished they had not participated in the operation. The police discovered a large amount of corruption among the police themselves. How did this happen? Keep watching to figure it out. On Monday morning, August 8, 2005, the Brazilian Federal Police received a communication that the Central Bank in Fortaleza had been robbed. This confused the police because the Central Bank was highly secured and had never been a robbery target before. The police officers arrived at the bank, and they were informed that the robbery took place in the basement. As we previously mentioned, it was Monday, which means that it was right after the weekend holiday. As usual, the bankers got back to work, entered the bank, and got down to the basement where the money was stored. They were surprised by an open hole in the ground, which seemed to lead to an underground tunnel. The weird thing was that the hole was very narrow, and the police knew that it was impossible to get into it. The first thing the police asked about was how much money was stolen. The bankers said that they didn't have an accurate number, but that it was over 100 million real. But after calculating accurately, they realized that it was 164 million real, which is worth almost $80 million. It was a sizable sum. The police were puzzled and confused as they sat near the hole. One of them, who was skinny, suggested entering the hole when they were unable to do so. It might be dangerous, a different officer warned him. Perhaps the robbers left some bombs inside, or they were still there, and perhaps they are armed. However, the fearless officer, who went by the name of Enias Sobrera, insisted on entering the hole. Enias got into the hole, reached the tunnel, and started crawling. The tunnel was supported by wooden planks, and there were ventilation tubes, fans, and lamps that were still on. This made Aeneas think that maybe the thieves were still there at the end of the tunnel, and most likely they were armed. He got scared that he took this risk, but he kept crawling as slowly as he could so as not to step on a trap left by the thefts, or maybe there was a bomb. He was so cautious. Aeneas kept crawling along the tunnel for an hour, although the tunnel was almost 70 meters long. He kept crawling slowly because he was scared. Finally, he reached the end of the tunnel, where he found a ladder leading to the top. He got up the ladder, carrying his gun, anticipating and ready for any surprise. He opened the tunnel manhole cover and started looking left and right, trying to find any trace of the thieves. The house seemed empty as if no one were there. There was a white powder on all the surfaces. It was used to cover the fingerprints. The house was upside down. Things were everywhere, trash, clothes, and tools, and all the windows were covered by wooden planks. After searching the place, he was sure that no one was there and that there was no trace of the money. There was a room full of sandbags, which were supposed to be the sand extracted from the tunnel. Aeneas climbed onto the roof of the house and discovered that he was very close to the bank, only about 70 meters away. He called his colleagues and told them his location. That house at the entrance of the tunnel, which was printed in green during the robbery, was in fact an interface for an artificial grass company. The whole story of this huge robbery began at that house. This news appeared in every journal and TV station, and even the foreign press made coverage of the event. Imagine that the journalists surrounded the house as soon as the police discovered it. As you can see, this is a real image of the hole from inside the house, and this is an image of the tunnel. It is obvious that this took time and money to make. The police examined the entire crime scene, the house, the bank basement, and everything else, just to know how the thieves carried out the operation. The police immediately noticed that there were many things in common between this operation and another robbery that took place a year before this operation in a city named Sao Paulo, 
a city known for robberies in which there were many gangs. The police came to the idea that there was a correlation between the two operations and that some of the first operation's executors must have been accomplices in the second operation. The thieves rented the house, painted it in green, and officially registered it as an artificial grass company, which was a good camouflage for the sand and soil that they got out of the house. As for the tunnel, they cut part of the floor and covered it. They made it look like the carpet. And in case of an emergency, for example, if someone else came in suddenly, they would immediately cover the hole. The tunnel's length was almost 73 meters. They dug it with simple manual tools, a shovel and a pickaxe, so as not to make noise. They used to put the sand and soil in bags and pull them up. And to support the tunnel, they used wooden planks and some steel planks. They used almost 900 wooden planks along the tunnel. They also used to extend ventilation tubes, fans, and lamps. All this is normally used in every tunnel, but the special thing in the thieves' tunnel was that they extended a water tube and a phone line. The water was used for work and also for drinking, and the phone line was used to keep communication between the ones in the tunnel and those who were up in the house. They were coordinating the work. Depending on some of the thieves that were arrested later on, he said that they worked in shifts. With seven people in each shift, it was non-stop work. They worked day and night. The biggest problem they had was soil. A truck used to come every day and take the soil bags out. When they got the bags out, people seemed to look at the house. It was a small neighborhood, and a truck came every day and carried a large number of bags of soil on it. This attracted people's attention and aroused suspicion. The thieves felt like this would probably put them in trouble, so they decided to store the soil bags inside the house. They put them in a room until it was full, locked it, and moved to another room until they filled several rooms in the house. Then they started pouring dirt bags in the backyard of the house, and they were trying to pave the dirt so that the ground remained at the same level. They claimed that the backyard ground ascended a meter because of the poured soil. The underground tunnel was almost straight with a small curve in a particular area to avoid the sewer pipe. Then the tunnel continued until it reached under the basement of the bank. The central bank basement was special. There was much special equipment that the bankers used. One of this equipment was a big crane. It's the orange machine, as you can see in this image. This machine is used to lift and move the huge money boxes that are in the basement. And these gray columns were crane trusses. The bankers usually work all day lifting and moving boxes from place to place. Each box weighs more than half a ton, which is why they needed a crane. At the end of the day, the bankers used to leave the crane where it was while they finished. Actually, what happened on Friday was that before the bankers closed the bank and left, the crane was placed next to the place where the thieves were digging the exit of their tunnel. The crane blocked the view on the surveillance cameras, and the police were suspicious of the weird coincidence and started thinking that some of the bankers might be accomplices, meaning that it was their plan to recruit one of the bankers to leave the crane exactly in that place to hide the camera. Another thing that helped the thieves was those steel gray columns. As you can see, they were along the wall and the boxes weren't next to the wall immediately, leaving a small space that became a passageway for the thieves. Although it was narrow, it was about six centimeters, but all the thieves were skinny, which is why the hole was narrow too. So they were able to walk through that passageway. This way, they remained unnoticed by the camera, so the guards didn't see them. The surveillance cameras were small. There were only six cameras in the basement, and it was supposed that they covered every angle in the basement, but there were some blind spots, especially between the wall and boxes. This was one of the security defects that the thieves knew how to take advantage of. Other than the crane in front of the hole, the thieves put a cart on it and supported a wooden board on it to make sure it wasn't seen on the camera. There was also another security system. There were thermoelectric sensors inside the basement, but the thieves weren't detected by the sensors because of their placement. The sensors should be placed on the walls, but they were on the ceiling instead, and the ceiling was rather high, so they couldn't cover most of the areas in the basement. The thieves knew this information before. 
They had secret information that no one was supposed to know but the guards and the bankers. Depending on this, the police formed a hypothesis about what happened that day. It was claimed that the thieves entered the basement for the first time between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. on Friday, which is the last hour of working at that time. The bankers closed the basement and got ready to leave the bank. That is to say that the working hours are not finished yet and the sensors are programmed to work after 7 p.m. So the officers claimed that the thieves entered the basement between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. That short period of time when the bankers closed the basement and were about to leave and the sensors were not working yet, they entered the basement and arranged it the way they wanted. First, they blocked the view of the hole, then checked on the passageways and the areas that weren't covered by the sensors. The accurate details they had about the basement prompted the officers to get sure that there was a banker or a guard who was helping them, but they weren't able to find a suspect. As for the thieves, on the night of the robbery, they started putting the money into bags immediately after they entered the vault. It was Friday night, so they had the whole weekend ahead and they could keep stealing without being noticed. The thieves kept on smuggling the bags through the tunnel, putting them in plastic carts and pulling them by slings. Each bag contained 5,000 real. Since they stole 164 million real, it means that they needed 330 bags. This is literally a huge amount. The police started their investigations immediately after discovering the robbery. The first thing they did was investigate the house and the company that the thieves founded and they discovered that the working license they got was in the name of someone named Paulo Sergio. It was weird that this man was wearing a beanie in his ID card photo, which made his recognition harder for the police. They were confused about how the Minister of Trade accepted this kind of photo, and they even suspected that he might have bribed someone. The police asked the neighbors about Paulo, who was the company owner, and they all claimed that he was kind, sociable, and nice to everyone. And this is one of the things that kept the thieves out of suspicion. Moreover, when the police started investigating the selling car and truck agencies, they knew that the stolen amount of money weighed three tons and a half. They immediately realized that the thieves must have used a number of cars or even a number of trucks to transport such a huge amount of money. While searching for sale deals, they found out that a car agency sold a certain number of trucks in cash trucks worth one million real, and the buyer was a man named Jose Charles. This man had a shipping company. Normally, a shipping company owner could buy trucks. But the weird thing was that he bought them all and paid in cash, and such deals are usually made through bank transactions. This prompted the police to conduct a sub-investigation into Charles and his company. When the police reached out to the company, they were surprised when the secretary told them that Charles, the boss himself traveled with the truck driver last Sunday. She told them that they had an urgent mission to deliver some cargo to Sao Paulo. As soon as the officers heard Sao Paulo, they knew that this shipping operation was related to the central bank robbery because they doubted that most of the thieves were from Sao Paulo. Bear in mind that Sao Paulo city is 3000 kilometers away from Fortaleza city where the central bank was. The question is why the officers doubted that the thieves were from Sao Paulo. As mentioned before, there was a large robbery in 2004, one year before the central bank robbery. That robbery took place in Sao Paulo, and the thieves used the same method. They dug an underground tunnel to rob the bank. The officers were already doubting that the thieves who carried out the Sao Paulo bank robbery were the ones who carried out the central bank robbery or most likely there were members in common. When the police knew that Charles, the owner of the company, traveled with the truck driver to Sao Paulo, they were almost sure that he went to transport the stolen money, or at least a portion of it. Because this seemed weird to the officers, why would the owner of a company travel with a truck driver for a simple shipment? After investigation, the police managed to find the truck, and it was a car transport truck. The cargo was cars. The truck was on the way to Fortaleza, where the central bank of Sao Paulo was. The road was more than 3,000 kilometers long, 
so the trip will take several days. The federal police got intel that the truck was currently in a city named Belo Horizonte, which is a city between Fortaleza and Sao Paulo. A group of officers took the helicopter and headed to the city. While landing, the commander got a call from the local police, who informed him that the truck had stopped at one of the police stations on the highway. The truck stopped at the police station on its own before the police got in its way, and the reason for this was the truck driver. The driver had no idea about what was going on. He was not an accomplice. In fact, he just got a call from his boss, Charles, during his weekend holiday, telling him that there was a card shipment that must be delivered as soon as possible. The driver cut off the weekend and came to transport the cargo. From the beginning of the mission, the driver was surprised at why moving cars is considered an urgent task, and what made him even more surprised was that Charles wanted to go with him. And this is the first time it happened. During the way, strange things happened. The driver noticed that Charles was always asking him to stop at a station and use payphones, and the driver wondered why Charles was not using his own phone. When they stopped at a station, Charles went to make a call and the driver got out of the truck to take a look at the cars they were loading. The cars were locked, but from the windows, he saw bundles of money on the car floor. He was surprised and said to himself that these cars would certainly be full of money, and he linked this to the robbery of the central bank because it had been covered extensively in the media. The driver decided to stop the truck at the first police station ahead on the way. The police had already gotten information about the truck, so they received him with their weapons, and then the federal police arrived. The driver and Charles got arrested and taken for questioning, and they extracted all the money that was in the cars, which was worth almost six million real. It wasn't a big amount of money. They had stolen 164 million real. When they started investigating Charles, they knew that he was the brother of Marco Rogero, who was suspected to be one of the drug smuggling leaders in Sao Paulo. During the investigations, they found out that Charles was not directly involved in the robbery. He was only an assistant but considered an accomplice. He was in charge of transportation, a truck, and so on, meaning that he wasn't among those who were at the house, dug the tunnel, and robbed the bank. He said that he didn't know most of the other robbers' identities, and he also claimed that everyone took his share, and he was just transporting his and his brother's share, which is the six million that were inside the cars. Charles helped the police and told them all what he knew. He said that the number of thieves was about 34, and he recognized no one but his brother. He used to see them but didn't know their names, and his brother was the coordinator between him and the other members of the gang. The investigators showed Charles several photos of the criminals that were suspected in order to identify some of his brother's friends. Charles managed to recognize some of the gang members and said that he had seen them before. These are photos and the names of those who were recognized by Charles. They were 10, among them Charles and his brother Marco. Pablo was the guy with the beanie who was the owner of the company. And of course, Pablo was a fake name. Elimao, who was a known criminal in Fortaleza, had a criminal record in huge robberies and was a permanent partner of Marco, Charles' brother, in previous operations, and the police thought that Alamao was one of the operation masterminds. Moises, one of the most important people in the gang, was imprisoned in a prison named Karanderu, but he broke out in 2001, along with a group of prisoners, and they carried out a huge breaking out operation in which 53 prisoners escaped through an underground tunnel. This man was a tunnel expert. Three years later, in 2004, Moises participated in a bank robbery in Sao Paulo, the robbery that was mentioned before. He participated in the two operations. In fact, he was the one who gathered the new gang to rob the central bank. He chose most of the gang members, and he was the one in charge of coordination. This would be discovered by the police later on, however. Moises had been one of their main suspects since the beginning. Then, the police had a list of suspects and many pieces of evidence. Their next move was to put them under surveillance because they aimed to get back the stolen money. The punishment for theft in Brazil was not harsh or severe. If they arrested the thieves, 
They would spend some years in prison, and then they would go out and enjoy their lives with the money they stole. And the police not only wanted to arrest the thieves, they also wanted to get the money back. One of the leads that the police followed was a phone number. When the police searched the house, and as it was previously mentioned, the house was in a terrible mess. After a long time of searching, one of the officers found a SIM card. This was so helpful because they tracked the number by contacting the telecom company. They managed to know the phone number and started eavesdropping on the calls. And here is one of the recordings. This recording shows that the thieves were still afraid to use the money they stole so as not to raise suspicions. The police managed to recognize the owner of the number, Antonio Edemar. This man had a criminal record too, so the police knew the area where he lived. They didn't know his exact location, but they knew the area where he lived, which was named Boa Viajem. A group of federal police officers took this man's file and started trying to track his exact location. While doing so, they managed to eavesdrop on another call, but this time it was important. Hello? Olha, faz um favor pra mim. Isso tem que ser urgente, tá? Ah. Era pra você ir na papelaria, comprar mais ou menos um kit de liga, um caderno e... Só o caderno que as canetas tem aqui. E trazer só aqui na portaria, entregar pra nós e ir embora. E nós não estamos podendo sair. E é responsa. Tá bom. Entendeu? Tchau, tchau. Tchau. In this call, Antonio asked a woman who might be his assistant to help him. He asked her to buy a large number of rubber bands, which they used to make money bundles. The police assumed that they were counting the money they stole, divided it into equal bundles, and tied it with rubber. At the same time, other officers managed to track Antonio's location, and they identified that he was in this red house that was in that area that we mentioned before. The officers, disguised as civilians, sat in a cafe in front of the house and started monitoring the house from afar. After a while, two men came out of the house. The officers sitting in the cafe noticed that one of those two men stared at them as if he suspected them. They felt like they were exposed, so they decided to reveal themselves. They pulled out their guns and ordered the two men to get down on the ground. Then the backup arrived, surrounded the house, and arrested all who were inside. As it was expected, the police found a huge amount of the stolen money inside the house. Money was everywhere, next to walls, in bags, in backpacks. They even found a hole in the ground full of money bags. Totally, they found more than 12 million real dollars inside the house. It seemed that it was the share of many people. The police arrested Antonio and everyone else that was inside the house. They also arrested a man named David the Old. In fact, this man was Antonio's boss, one of the operation executors, and the one in charge of giving members shares, and he used to write the amounts down in a notebook. These were the two main people that the police arrested in the house, Antonio and David. However, three other people were arrested too. Although they weren't directly involved in the central bank robbery, they were David's guys. During the investigations with them, the police managed to find new leads to new suspects. Every group of officers worked on a lead, so the case became a bit complicated. One of the gang members who was arrested, whose name was Dismar, confessed that he bribed one of the bank's guards who was his friend, whose name was Edilson. The guard helped them learn everything about the security system of the bank basement. Therefore, they managed to avoid all cameras and movement sensors. They also knew about the crane and the narrow passageway between the wall and the money boxes. They had all the details that we previously mentioned, thanks to this guard. This means that the police's suspicions were right. The thieves had an assistant from inside the bank. Let's move to the second suspect. While the police were working on a lead, they knew about a man named Raymando Lorendo. 
The police were tracking his calls with his girlfriend, despite the fact that he was careful and used payphones instead of his personal phone. Due to the tracking, the police managed to identify his location. They were sure that he was one of the gang members, so they kept tracking him for a period of time. This was 10 months after the central bank robbery. One day, Raimondo traveled to another city named Porto Alegre. The police kept following up on him from his arrival at the airport. He then met with a man named Alessandro, whose nickname was The Fat. Raimondo and his friend Alessandro rode in a car and headed to this house, and of course, they were followed by the police. The police kept monitoring the house, and after a while, three other men came and entered the house. More people kept coming each time. The officers claimed that there were 11 people in total inside the house, and everyone came in at different times, so the police immediately realized that those people were planning something. The police followed Alessandro when he came out of the house and went to a bus station, where a group of people was waiting for him, and they rode the car with him on this pickup truck that you see in the image. They were loading many things, as you can see. Alessandro took that group to an area in the middle of the city, and he dropped them off at this building, where they unloaded all the things that were on the pickup truck. The police would then discover that these people bought that building, and it was in the name of someone named Fabreso. He bought it for one million and a half real. The question is, why would a group of thieves buy a building? And why were they putting their staff and things inside? The police discovered that they were digging a new tunnel, and when they explored the area, they found that there was a big bank named Banrissel, which was very close to the building. The bank had many huge vaults underground, and this was the thieves' new target. This image shows clearly how close the bank was to the building. The gang that was willing to carry out the Banrissel Bank robbery wasn't the same gang that carried out the Central Bank robbery, but there were some members in common who led the police to find the new gang. The police didn't have any evidence that proved what the gang used to do inside the building, so they needed a way to monitor them secretly. The police rent a building in front of the thieves' building. As this image shows, this is the police's building, this is the thieves' building, and this is the bank's building. The police put up their surveillance cameras and devices, which provided them with a clear view of the thieves' building from different angles. The thieves were pretending to be workers, and they were restoring the building. They were even wearing workers' clothes and a safety helmet so as not to attract suspicions. The police noticed that they were extracting a huge amount of trash so they knew that it was sand and soil that they dug. The commander of the police unit that was monitoring the thieves asked his team to check on that trash. If it was ground debris, it meant that they were still breaking the floor. If it was soil and sand, it meant that they had already started digging the underground tunnel. And if it was concrete and iron, it meant that they had reached the bank basement. The plan was to keep monitoring them. And when the thieves got close to the bank basement, the police would immediately intervene and catch them red-handed. However, an unexpected thing happened. While the police were eavesdropping on the thieves' calls, they discovered that the thieves were being blackmailed by a third party. The latter seemed to know what they were doing inside the building and was blackmailing them in order to take a share of the loot in return for not exposing them. The police were afraid that the third party would make things more complicated. Even the police couldn't guess that party's identity. Actually, the third party was two people who came to the building. While the police were monitoring the building, they saw him entering the building and talking to the thieves. Imagine what they discovered. The police found out that the third party was a police officer too. They were corrupt officers that blackmailed the thieves to get money and stay away from them. This prompted the federal police to execute a raid as soon as possible and arrest the gang. They put two snipers on the front building roof as a backup in case of an emergency. As for the storming forces team, they surrounded the building and entered through the main door. And this is a real picture of the moment of the storm. Inside the building, the thieves didn't show any kind of resistance because they weren't armed, so they immediately surrendered. The special forces took control of the building easily. 
The number of gang members that were arrested by the police was 26 in total, and the police really found the hole and the tunnel, which were covered by a wooden plank. The tunnel was supported by wooden and steel planks. The experts who examined the tunnel assured me that the digging was done in the same way as the central bank tunnel digging. When the police stormed the tunnel, the thieves had already dug almost 78 meters, and they had only 12 meters left to reach the bank vault. Among the arrested gang, there were only two people who were confirmed to be in the gang that robbed the central bank, Ray Mando and his friend Alessandro the Fat. In 2007, two years after the central bank robbery, some suspects had not yet been found, but investigations remained ongoing. The police were investigating the same way, either by monitoring the criminals and their families, eavesdropping on their calls, or other things like that. Some of these suspects' arrest moments were very interesting. For instance, this suspect, whose name was Jose Marliotto, was found with a big beard. At first, they didn't recognize him, but they would do so after seeing his wife. One of the police officers came to him and whispered, We are federal police. The game is over. Imagine that he fainted as soon as he heard the word of the federal police. When he woke up, he found himself tied up, and the police were filming him. And that's what he said. Um ano e dois meses no mato. Eu quase vi, eu quase virei um bicho, cara. Eu passei uma situação tão feia de um jeito. Eu comia milho verde, carrapato, e por no meu corpo eu passava mão de cera assim os eitos. It's kind of weird that he said that the past two years were the worst years of his life. Although he was a millionaire, he was living in stress. He used to ask the police to put him in jail. It would be better for him and he was willing to leave his bad past behind and start a new phase of life. The police asked him to lead them to the money he had. And indeed, he brought out two bags from under the ground that contained two ice boxes. The first contained money, and the second contained property documents for all the real estate that he bought. The police confiscated everything, the money, the real estate, and the properties. The police commander even claimed that they were sure that this man became as poor as he was before the robbery. Another suspect was arrested in the same year, 2007. A limau, whom the police thought was one of the Operation Masterminds. The police found him with long hair and a big beard, and he tried to change his appearance, but he couldn't. He even used to have several fake identities. When the police were monitoring him, they weren't really sure that he was him due to his changed appearance, but eventually they managed to recognize him due to a tattoo on his right arm. In the end, they arrested him, confirmed the charge against him, and confiscated all the money, properties, and real estate he had. Let's move on to the next suspect. At the beginning of 2008, the man with the beanie and the house were registered in his name, Paulo Sergio. This was the name registered in the Ministry of Merchants' documents, of course. It was a fake name. And then the police would discover that his real name was Belo Horizonte. The police managed to track him and arrest him at the car rental company. He was coming out of the company building when they came to him and told him, We are police, and you are under arrest. His reaction was weird. He didn't believe them because they were dressed as civilians. They even showed him their badges but he didn't believe them. He kept screaming and saying that they were kidnapping him, and the police replied that they were arresting him. He remained resistant, but in the end, they arrested him, took him to the police station, started the investigation, and then they knew the reason for his reaction. But first, they asked how he could get an ID card, and since he wore a beanie in the photo, he replied that he forged it. After that, he told them about the reason for his reaction while he was arrested. He said that he had already been kidnapped twice because of the central bank robbery, and the kidnappers pretended to be police, so he used to pay them in order to be released. He even said that, in one of those two operations, he got shot. The central bank robbers were all chased by other gangs. Everyone wanted their money. This will be repeated with the rest of the gang, and the right example for that is Marliotto who was hidden in the woods for two years, just to run away from the other gangs. The other suspect was a man whom we have already mentioned, 
Moises, the man that escaped from prison along with 53 prisoners. He was an expert in digging tunnels and participated in the Sao Paulo bank robbery before the central bank robbery. Most of the criminals that were arrested said that Moises was the one who recruited them, which means that he was the one who gathered most of the gang members, so he was one of the operation commanders. The police were focusing on him in particular, but Moises was a smart guy. He knew how to stay a fugitive for a long time. They couldn't arrest him until 2009, four years after the central bank robbery. The police finally managed to track him through his wife. They kept eavesdropping on her calls, and they knew that on some weekends, she took her son to his father, Moses, so he could see him. The police tracked his location and found out that he was in a building in Sao Paulo, as you can see in this image. The police recognized his car, and before arresting him, they first made sure that his car was parked in the underground parking. In order to prevent Moises from making any fuss or trying to escape, the police decided to make an incident. They asked the building guard to call Moises and tell him that one of the building residents, while going out of the parking lot, hit his car by accident and asked him to come. And really, Moises went down and the police were watching him through surveillance cameras. As you can see, he came out of his apartment, took the elevator and went down, having no idea what was waiting for him. As soon as the elevator door was opened, he was surprised by the huge number of federal police officers that were in front of him. He looked at them, shocked. The police immediately told him that he was under arrest. Thus, one of the masterminds of the central bank robbery fell down. Moises told the police that he thought they forgot about him. It's been four years since they robbed the bank, but the officer replied that they didn't. The police knew that Moises was one of the three main masterminds of the operation. The other was Alamo, whom we have mentioned previously, and the one whom the police found changed appearance. The third person left was dubbed Fernandino. This man was a known criminal in Sao Paulo, the police had already known about him as one of the biggest drug dealers in the city. In fact, he was the financier of the operation. Such an operation needed investment. It needed house rental, company registration, digging tools, food for the gang members, cars, trucks, and gasoline. All of these things needed money. Fernandino paid three million real to finance the operation, and according to the police information, his share of the stolen money was the biggest. He took 15%, and since they stole 146 million real, that means that his share was about 25 million real. In the world of gangs, as soon as someone suddenly gets a huge amount of money, he becomes a target. Imagine that Fernandinho was kidnapped twice, and those who kidnapped him were wearing police uniforms. It was not known whether they were disguised or corrupt police. But after the kidnapping, they demanded a ransom worth a million. The family paid the ransom, but the kidnappers didn't release Fernandino until the police found him dead. He was killed. Later, the police managed to get the kidnappers' identities, and it turned out that they were corrupt police. According to the investigations, the corrupt police officers and Fernandino used to know each other before. And when they kidnapped him and took the ransom, they decided to kill him because they were pretty sure that if they released him, he would definitely avenge. The kidnappers killed him along with many other people who might recognize him. They wanted to get rid of all the traces that could lead the police to them. Fernandinho wasn't the only gang member who was kidnapped for ransom. Most of the criminals involved in the central bank robbery were pursued by police, criminals, and corrupt police. They wished they had been arrested instead of being pursued by all these people. For instance, one of the gang members named Pedro was in his house when he suddenly found a group of people at his door pretending to be police officers. They asked him to hand them the money that he stole, and while he was trying to understand what was going on, they stormed his house, hit him and his family, and stole all the money that was in his house. More than one million real. Eventually, Pedro surrendered himself. The robbery of Brazil's central bank was one of the craziest cases this country has ever experienced. Its impact was not limited to the theft of a large sum, 
but extended to a large number of cases and crimes, including kidnapping, extortion, and so on. Moreover, it prompted many gangs to move towards that kind of operation. Bank robberies through underground tunnels became a trend, and the police found tens of tunnels annually. Some of the operations were thwarted before taking place, and others were carried out. To conclude, the case was resolved completely. They discovered the criminal network and arrested most of them. And of course, some of them were dead. However, there was only one person left, and the police didn't manage to arrest him to this day. His name is Juvenal, and he was the only one who managed to escape. As for the others, they were all arrested. The police were able to get back almost 34 million reals of the stolen money. It is a small portion, but they couldn't get any more back. The thieves laundered a lot of money and bought real estate and property at cheap prices only to launder the money let alone the money that was paid as ransom. Most of the defendants, if they were convicted of theft only, would have spent a short period in prison because the punishment for theft in Brazil is not severe. But they were sentenced to money laundering, which is a much stronger concern than theft, as most of them were sentenced to large sentences because every property they bought, every car, and every device is a separate charge. So many sentences were accumulated on them. Some of them have been sentenced to more than a hundred years, meaning a life sentence. We have come to the end of our story today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe for more interesting stories.